must constantly look at things in a different way. The Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast was created by two physical therapists out of the desire to learn more about the different educational roles in physical therapy and healthcare and how healthcare education works by talking with educational leaders and people with different perspectives within physical therapy and across interdisciplinary lines on how education can be improved to disrupt the status quo of healthcare education. This is our journey, and thanks for listening. Are you a third-year physical therapy student that excels on tests when you have study guides, checklists, and deadlines? With all of the information available about how to prepare for the NPTE, it's easy to get disorganized and not feel prepared going into the big day. NPTE Prep Success is an online course that provides PT students easy-to-use study guides and step-by-step guidance through the NPTE preparation. To learn more, visit kylericeprep.com. Thank you again all for your continued support, and now for the show. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. I'm Stephanie Wyrock, and our wonderful guest, Glenn Rusco. Glenn is a physiotherapist from Perth, Australia. He's a super advocate for the profession and is dedicated to using the power of the internet to help physiotherapists and physiotherapists physical therapists from all over the world reach colleagues and consumers across international borders. His vision is to unite our global profession and has resulted in Glenn launching the .physio domain extension so that we can create our own digital identity on the internet. So thank you so much, Glenn, for joining us today. Thanks, Steph. Thank you for having me. For those of our listeners who maybe aren't familiar or haven't heard of you, Glenn, can you just give us a little bit of information about yourself and kind of where you ended up where you are today? Yeah, sure. Um, Look, my title is I am a specialist musculoskeletal physiotherapist uh, and I work in private practice. Uh, I have an MBA, I teach, uh, I've been heavily involved with our professional association and regulating bodies. Uh, before commencing my studies, uh, I, I did physics and computing, so I've always felt comfortable in the digital world. Uh, indeed, my practice was one of the first in the world to have a website way back in 1995, uh, and I developed some ergonomic keyboarding software at the height of the repetitive strain injury uh, epidemic. Uh, I have a fabulous wife, three exceptional children, a dog, and four chickens. <laughs> that is so cool that you're private practice was one of the first to have a website you know for a younger person like myself just the thought of that is so crazy to me because the internet is such a normal part of our lifestyle nowadays I mean your passion for physical therapy and physiotherapy is super inspiring it's one thing that I have loved about um being in this profession is that there is so much to do what inspired you for this vision of global unification uh in 2010 uh, the states and territories of australia opted to move from a multiple jurisdictions to uh, of health professional regulation to a national model Uh, the impetus was a productivity commission report that identified that the multi-jurisdictional model was a limiter to the free movement of health professionals across borders and therefore a barrier to productivity improvements. Um, I was appointed chairman of the inaugural Physiotherapy Registration Board of Australia and also elected to be the chairman of the chairs of the other nine health professions involved. So I was heavily involved in the regulatory unification of the health professions in our country. And in that role, I met with leaders of regulating authorities from other countries and recognised that the bureaucracy of each jurisdiction that prevented the easy movement of health professionals across borders were artificial, arcane, not evidence-based. And while my term on the board ended, my desire to connect the practitioners of of the globe uh, became stronger. So you said that, uh, I'm just going to ask a quick follow-up question. You said that some of these regulations that were being passed weren't evidence-based. Based on kind of your knowledge and your experience, what, why would you say that these regulations are being made without evidence? What do you think is the reason for that? Yeah, look, the, the law is generated by politicians who, who don't necessarily work in the field. 
and the regulators are then given the task of adapting those laws and creating standards and guidelines and codes of practice that fit. Now, they do that without research. It's a matter of a bureaucracy. How do we've got a great volume of people. How do we manage and control them? Uh, there's very little research in the area of health practitioner regulation. Much of what you promote on your website is physical therapy consultation, which is something here in the United States that is starting to be talked about telemedicine over social media platforms like you know Facebook Live. Um, we are limited with a lot of telemedicine because of things like licensure and insurance. So in the United States, um, if you're licensed in one state, it doesn't mean you can practice in another state. So if you were doing something over Facebook Live to somebody in a different state, you're technically going against your license. And same with insurance. How have you overcome these barriers? Well, Steph, at the risk of inciting a little trouble, I just ignore them. I'm all for a bit of civil disobedience and disruption, especially when the rules are dumb. Who could possibly believe that physical therapists in one of your states are really any less capable or a danger to the public than those in another state, particularly when you all sit the same NPT? E exam. It, it's truly ridiculous. We need to recognise that those in power are the least incentivized to accept change. And having been inside the tent myself, I, I know that much of the power of licensing authorities and insurers is bluff. So just do it. Do a good job and the licensing authorities will never know about it and the patients will pay you handsomely. And eventually this new behaviour will become the norm and the weight of public acceptance will force the authorities to modify their rules accordingly. If I could just talk on one example, yeah, um, the Physiotherapy Board of New Zealand recently uh, released a paper that touched on telehealth. And uh, it uh, says quite strongly that if they discover that a physiotherapist or physical therapist from outside of New Zealand provides a service to a New Zealander, then they'll report you to your licensing authority. Now, it's all bluff because you, you are beyond their reach. But they have no, no um, recourse, no way to, to, to reach you. Uh, firstly, how will they ever know that you did that? And secondly, what part of the legislation, standards, codes or policies of your own jurisdiction have you breached? So licensing authorities can only respond to clearly outlined breaches, not that you've been naughty. So almost like a scare tactic. Oh, yeah, because they lack the legislative power to actually take action. So they're coming out with bluff that, oh, you'll get into trouble. But you'll notice that it's very unclear. There's no clear prescription of exactly what the problem is or, or the penalty because it just simply doesn't exist. Well, speaking of, you know, somebody from outside the United or from New Zealand uh, treating somebody in New Zealand, I mean, you've consulted with and worked with physical therapists and patients from all over the world. What similarities and differences have you noticed between the United States healthcare systems and other healthcare systems around the world? Well, the, the similarities around the world are, are highly dedicated professionals seeking to help their patients in the best possible way. That's global. Uh, the differences are just structural based on how much power physiotherapists and physical therapists have managed to achieve. Uh, if we go back in history, governments the world over have created models of health where medicine is at the apex and they've appointed medical doctors as the gatekeepers of health. And this has produced financial, legislative and cultural barriers for physiotherapists and physical therapists. Um, the relative uh, and each of those barriers strengthens medicine's superiority. Now, the relative autonomy of each uh, of physiotherapists and physical therapists varies across each country, depending on how successful they've been in overcoming these impediments. For example, direct access to patients, government supported training programs, uh, clinicians, clinicians having imaging rights or financial subsidization of their services, you know, whether by government or insurers. So it really comes down to how effective has the profession in that country been at exerting their rights. So, you know, in, in Australia, I, if I'm correct in saying this, in Australia, physiotherapists are seen as like the musculoskeletal primary care providers. And here in the United States, that's still something that hasn't really happened. Um, what are, 
what is kind of the proliferation of Australia leading that charge and having physiotherapists being the primary care providers? And what can we do here in the United States to make that go faster? Yeah, look, first of all, I'll identify it's a cultural thing uh, rather than a financial, uh, financial thing. The legislative barriers are down because we have primary contact status, but there are financial barriers in that our competitor doctors are subsidised by the government. Uh, but, so it's a cultural thing. Physiotherapy in Australia has managed basically to do a better job than medicine. And uh, how we reached that, I, I suspect, was related to our early primary contact status. So in 1973, uh, we started uh, primary contact and with that challenge in front of us the quality of our work has risen uh, and consequently the public recognize that they get a better service from a physiotherapist than they do from a medical doctor and so they have shifted over uh, and it's just been a cultural change. Do you think that that's from physiotherapists in Australia just marketing their ability to help people a little bit better to the general public or do you think that that is more of just a shift in how people were thinking? It's a shift based on better outcomes. You just get better quality service from a physiotherapist with a musculoskeletal injury. What if, uh, you know, you're a business owner, um, you've been a business owner for many, many years. What advice do you have to healthcare, to other healthcare business owners and educators who potentially want to expand their message to a global audience? Uh, well, firstly, I want to congratulate them on their foresight and assure them that with this strategy, their future success is assured. Um, the, the internet has created a distributive power that has destroyed the barriers of cost, time, distance. A, a digital product or a service created in Memphis, for example, can now be equally consumed in Montreal, Madrid, Manchester, Mumbai, Manila, Melbourne. Uh, and that product or service can be delivered immediately and cheaper than any others. Consumers love digital products. So my advice to healthcare business owners and educators is you must expand your services to consider a global audience. Because if you don't, someone else will, and you're going to lose. Uh, th those who do go global will expand their markets far beyond the three suburb radius, typically enjoyed by the average clinic, and they'll enjoy amazing uh, success. So my specific advice in terms of practical strategy for those wishing to go global are really simple. There's three, niche, brand, and digitize. So if I can explain quickly, niche means narrow it right down. Narrow it down to your expertise, your passion, and your best opportunity. Don't be frightened that you'll be too narrow. Your niche just gets them in the door. Thereafter, you'll have a customer forever, uh, and you can supply a range of services. Brand means to create your identity, to protect it, to make sure it's consistent across all media, and then to live it in all respects. And finally, digitize. Convert your product, your service into a digital format. That way it can be replicated in an infinite number of times, transported to an infinite number of customers, and it'll last for an infinite amount of time with, with no increase in production costs. Uh, if anyone wants any help in this area, give me a call because it's, it's my favorite area. It's my passion. Do you educate your, how do you educate your global audience about, you know, who physiotherapists are and what we do? I mean, in the United States, I think there's, there's still a, a wide range of consumers that, you know, you ask them what a physical therapist does and they say, oh, they give massages and, oh, they stretch me. And obviously we're so much more than that. Yeah, this is tough. Our profession so far has really failed to articulate well or capture exactly the value of what we bring. Amazingly, despite this, we're the third largest health profession and our reputation is extraordinary for quality and trust. So just imagine what we could do if we could get our shit together and develop a brand with a clear message and a clear benefit. But you ask me what I do, um, I don't waste time and energy converting new clients to physiotherapy. Instead, I invest all my efforts into my existing clients and then I let them share the value of what I have, uh, of what I have to offer to their friends and family because people seek advice from the people they trust and family and friends rate highest in that regard. Uh, so don't waste your time on the new, trying to get new clients. Spend it all on your existing clients and let them educate others on the value of physio. Um, yep, that'll do. 
I don't know how many times I've gone on Facebook and one of my Facebook friends says, oh, I'm having terrible neck pain. Do you guys have any recommendations for any treatments? And it's always like chiropractic care, ice, some herbal supplement. And very rarely do uh, these friends and family even suggest physical therapy. So I think that that's a really great statement that you said, Glenn, that it's you got to make the people that are already uh, believers, I guess you could say, in, in physiotherapy and physical therapy and have them spread that message to other people because I totally think it's true, especially after being on social media for so long now, that people are going to take the advice of their friends and family. Yeah, raving fans, Steph, is what we're trying to create. I like that, raving fans. How did you, you know, you created this dot .physio domain extension. Tell us a little bit about what inspired this and um, where, what the future of dot .physio is. About eight years ago, the authority that controls the internet naming recognized that innovation was necessary, particularly as the dot .com space is reaching near capacity. So they opened a window and said, we'll invite applications by interested parties to create any new domain extension you want. And as a private practitioner, I thought the idea of a dot .physio domain name would be terrific. I, I could register my business name, my, my personal name, my locations, my area of specialty. And then I realized that if every physio and physical therapist did the same, what an extraordinary, powerful global brand we could create. So I made contact with the Australian Physio Association and the World Confederation for Physical Therapy. Unfortunately, neither of them could be involved, but I decided it was too good to let it go. So with their support, I made an application for Dot Physio and was successful. Now, Dot Physio is one of 1,400 new domain extensions. Over 500 multinational companies have domain extensions like Dot Apple, Dot Google, Dot Netflix, Dot Toyota. Over 200 cities have domain extensions like .New York, .Paris, .London, .Sydney. There's .Weddings, .NBL, .Basketball, .Army, .Shop. And 19 professions have domain extensions like .Doctor, .Dentist, .Lawyer, and of course .Physio. And what this does, it creates the most extraordinary branding opportunity because your URL your website address is your brand. They're one and the same. And so instead of having this bricks and mortar and virtual world divide, we've put it together into a single place. I love how you say that this is branding physio. It is, it is. It's a clear marker um, that says who I am, what I do, and you can trust. You know, you mentioned all these different you know, dot Apple, dot Google, and that this was an application process that you went through. But I'm sure that along the way, you've run into a few issues or had to go through some barriers and hoops to kind of make this the animal it is today. What are some of those barriers and hoops that you had to go through? Uh, well, look, the authority that controls the naming um, did a really good job. And the, the process of application was clearly roadmapped to build the policies and the procedures, and I was ably helped by some existing registry companies. Uh, the whole process from idea to launch took about four years, which is longer than expected, but it was a, a function of the significant, significantly greater number of applications they received than they thought they ever would. There, there were 1,900 applications for 1,400 unique domain extensions, and each one had to be individually processed. Um, that process of application, um, and compliance were and are highly detailed. And midway through the process, the governments of the world decided to get involved and uh, added a few extra regulatory barriers. Uh, for example, uh, in response to one of their concerns regarding title protection, we have an eligibility policy that limits the, the use of dot physio domains to members of the physiotherapy, physical therapy community. Uh, and so this policy is policed on application through random audits and via response to complaints. And it does increase the cost, but it ensures a higher quality of the domain because internet users can be confident that the information they receive from a dot physio website comes from a bona fide physiotherapist or physical therapist. Mm. So no fake news with that then. Yep. You know, you, <laughs> you mentioned branding. 
as you know, a reason for it to be important to have this dot physio domain be amongst all physical therapists. Are there any other reasons that you think it's important for us to unite under this domain? Uh, well, look, it's a great question, and, and I've alluded to some of the reasons in my previous answers, but I'll just put, them, put it all together in one story. Just as advances in communication technology and economic growth 40 years ago facilitated the progression from local, state, or provincial pro professional groups to national associations that we have today, well, current modern technologies and economic growth now allow us to progress from national associations to a global collective. These same technologies have flattened the hierarchy of communication, or another way of putting it is it's democratized publishing. Where previously cost barriers restricted mass communication to a top-down structure, now ideas, concepts, innovations can come from anywhere, anytime, uh, anyone. Your, your pod podcast is a perfect example. Now, consistency is always important for any brand, but now with more players publishing, a consistent brand identity is a first step to avoiding confusion. So if you think of global car companies, you know, in the past, they may have had different names in different markets. For example, the Volkswagen Golf was known as the Rabbit or a Carib or a Bora or a City in different countries. But manufacturers now recognize that with modern communications technology, the globe is a single market. A Volkswagen Golf is a Volkswagen Golf in every part of the world. So if physiotherapy and physical therapy is ever going to realize its full potential, we must have a consistent brand identity. And that dot physio domain extension provides our profession with that clear brand identity in the very space where the global market exists, the internet. So every time a dot physio domain is used, our brand identity strengthens. I think that that's interesting, you know, talking about how we need to strengthen our brand identity because the, you know it's a global marketplace now however mm. one thing that i i kind of am thinking about is you know training for physiotherapists varies across the world i mean in, in italy physical therapists are trained at a technical level in australia a bachelor's level in the united states a doctorate level do you think that pt education needs to be standardized across the world much like the branding of the profession is across this physio domain and if so you know, why or why not? Yeah, good question. Look, firstly, the level of qualification is not a direct reflection of the quality of training. So for example, in Australia, uh, whilst we primarily have a four years bachelor's program, we do also have institutions that offer a three year clinical doctorate and a two and a bit year graduate entry masters. Now, I'm not in a, in a position to comment which of those training programs is better, but I can assure you that they all meet the physiotherapy practice thresholds required by the the accrediting authority, the Australian Physiotherapy Council. And therefore, every graduate from one of those programs is registered as a physiotherapist. But clearly, if we have a global brand identity, it follows that to deliver the values of that brand, we must standardize the service delivery. And fundamental to a consistent service delivery is the standardization of training. Now, could you imagine how much more people would value our service if it were consistent? Could you imagine how easy it would be to update education programs with new evidence if they were standardized? Just imagine how easy it would be to travel and work across jurisdictions if your qualifications were accepted across all regulating authorities. Now, clearly it's not gonna happen in the short term because of the huge economic disparity in the world and the differing needs governments have identified for their physiotherapy services. So I'd propose the creation of a three or four level structure of education standardization where countries or jurisdictions or even institutions themselves could could be assessed by an independent body and they just slot into their various level and as the quality of the education as the profession matures in that country so they can progress up the, the level um, and what that meant means is that people who educate from programs or countries at the same level can move freely across those jurisdictions because everyone knows their standard. Um, just a, another example, um, about three or four years ago, Australia and New Zealand uh, developed mutual common education standards. And what that means is the physios can move between the two countries uh, because they're educated at the same level. Um, I understand communications begun with Canada 
and it would not be a huge leap for the US jurisdictions, the Irish, the British, the South African regulators to connect with this Australia New Zealand model to unite. Uh, just imagine how exciting that would be. Yeah, that's really interesting. I haven't even heard about that. I mean, you know, one of the things that we've been talking about uh, at the last few conferences that I've been attending has been, you know, how do we standardize our profession? How do we standardize not only clinical care, but education as well? And I think that, you know, obviously Australia and New Zealand have it totally figured out. They're the primary care providers of musculoskeletal conditions and they have already standardized their education. So I really admire your, your guys' your guys's countries for doing that. A lot of what you've been talking about with branding and delivering a consistent product reminds me a lot of a book that I read um, not too long ago called The E-Myth, which has been a really um, influential book in how I think about my branding myself and what I do as a physical therapist. What book has had the largest impact on your professional or personal life? Steph, it's The E-Myth. Oh my gosh, are you <laughs> kidding me? No, no. no I, uh, when I first started in private practice, uh, I recognized that it just was not viable with me doing everything. And, and I, I was directed towards the e-myth and I just, you know, I consumed that book. I read it three times. Uh, it, it really spoke to me and I put it into practice and I've been putting it into practice ever since. And, and so, Steph, you and I would probably say together that if, if any of your listeners have not read it, get out there and read it. Oh you know, no wonder why it sounded like you were like, re like talking about everything. Yeah, you yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I was like thinking that the whole time. Yeah, you guys, seriously, if you have not read the E Myth and you really want to improve your brand identity or you want to help physical therapy just improve our brand in general as physical therapists, definitely check that book out. It's a great book. So, the last question that we have, Glenn, is a question that we ask all of our guests. And it is, if you could change one aspect of healthcare education in physical therapy or any other profession, which aspect would you change and how would you change it? Uh, listen, I've already identified standardization as a key issue and I, and I could comfortably rest on that. But Steph, seeing as you offered, let me add another. I would like to improve the teaching of physiotherapy and physical therapy history. Uh, historian Anders Otteson, a uh, Scandinavian um, researcher identified that the physiotherapy profession's lack of historical reference is extraordinary. And he actually described us as, as suffering a collective amnesia. He said that if one were to consult sociology textbooks to determine how professions operate to defend and maximize their interests, physiotherapy complies to the letter with one glaring exception. We rarely use history to legitimize our efforts. Now, why is that? And I suspect it's because we don't know it. We don't know because we were never taught. It simply doesn't exist in the curriculum. Uh, if I could give you, you an example about your history. Did you know that the APTA first commenced in 1921 and was known as the American Women's Physical Therapeutic Association? I did. They denied... I yeah, okay, they yeah. denied the entry of men. And it wasn't until the following year that it renamed itself the American Physiotherapy Association. And for some 25 years, you guys were known as physiotherapists as well. It wasn't until the late 40s that it was changed to physical therapy. Now, just imagine how much easier my job would be if you guys had stuck with that. I did not know the physiotherapy aspect of it. Yeah, that right. would make your job really easy. <laughs> 25 years. Now, this is a big opportunity for me to give a plug. Are you ready? I'm ready. The newly, for the newly formed International Physiotherapy History Association has a website located at history.physio. You got oh, it. So there's it. some fabulous stories in there. And see the branding value of, of history.physio? It just it says what it is, where to go for more information, it's all there in the brand, in the URL. So, look, I recommend everyone go and have a look at www.history.physio. There are some fabulous articles on there. They're short, easy to read. And if you sign up, it's free. Uh, you'll get an email each week saying what new stories are coming up. And it's stories, stories are what unite us. You know, every culture, uh, every group, every tribe, every family have their stories. Physiotherapy, physical therapy is missing our stories. And this is a place that we can find them. 
You know, the history, the history comment that you make is, is really interesting. I don't know if we've heard that on our show. And I think that, you know, the famous saying is, if, if we don't learn from history, history will repeat itself. You know, so history is a very important part of helping us develop and move into the future. So I really appreciate that answer. It's very, I feel like it's very philosophical. So I like that. Well, you know, Glenn, I think everybody, you've piqued everybody's curiosity about uh, the dot physio domain and about branding. It's, I mean, about the e-myth. So, you know, I'm sure people are going to have questions for you. If, if people want to follow up with you, where can they find you online if they would like to uh, ask you a question or get, you, get some more advice from you? Yeah, look, connect with me, please, people. I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook, I'm on LinkedIn. Just search Glenn Rusco. Uh, I welcome questions, comments, and advice about globalizing our profession. I love to help physiotherapists and physical therapists who are interested in digital marketing uh, from a global perspective. And, and I'd encourage you all to register a dot physio domain name. Just go to www.dot.physio. Perfect. Well, thank you, Glenn, for joining us today. And we'll put all that information in the show notes so that you can contact Glenn as needed. So thank you, Glenn, for uh, talking to us today. It was a pleasure getting to speak to you. Thanks, Steph. Access to healthcare is one of the largest issues facing both providers and patients, as millions of people worldwide lack timely and affordable access to healthcare. Anywhere Healthcare, a telehealth platform, is a simple, low cost option for providers and patients that eliminates the barriers to access to all kinds of healthcare. To find out more, check out anywhere.healthcare, which is available on our show notes. And if you use the code HET in all caps when you email to sign up, you'll save 25% off the total cost. Thank you for attending class today, and we hope that you learned something and gained value from the content. If you'd like to schedule office hours with us, feel free to add us on Twitter at HET Podcast, on Instagram, HET Podcast, on Facebook, the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, and the homepage, Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast.com. And for those of you following along in the syllabus, extra credit can be obtained by liking us, sharing us, and leaving a review. Let's continue our journey up Mount Educational Success as lifelong learners.